Podcastle, episode 716 for Tuesday the 4th of January 2022. Tadpole Prophecy by Avi Burton, read by Sarah Griffin, rated PG-13. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to Podcastle, the flying castle of fantasy fiction. I'm your host, Matt Dovey, and I'm delighted to present for your excitement and enjoyment a Podcastle original, Tadpole Prophecy, written by Avi Burton and narrated for you by Sarah Griffin. This episode is rated PG-13. So, first off, I want to back up a bit and say, yes, hello, I'm your host, Matt Dovey. After four years' excellent work, Summer Fletcher is stepping back. It is honestly hard to overstate what an impact they've had on their time at the castle, both as a measured and thoughtful host, but also behind the scenes as assistant editor, where they've done tireless, sterling work organising the slush crew, recruiting and checking in on us, as well as all the admin work to support the co-editors, including the transitions between Kalida and Sheree, and then Jen and Sheree to Shingai and Eleanor. We've been on one heckin' streak of awards nominations of late, including our first ever time as Hugo finalists, World Fantasy Award finalists, British Fantasy Award finalists and winners, the Fire Award, the Aurora Award. And Summer has been a huge part of all that, the absolute bedrock of the castle. So I wanted to take this opportunity to thank them and pay tribute to them. So much of their work was behind the scenes, but I promise you that each and every one of you listening has benefited from it and we will all miss them terribly. You can keep up with what they're up to by following them on Twitter as at Scribblesassin, or go and sign up for their newsletter on their website at summerfletcher.com. I've signed up, so should you. So I'm stepping up as host, having popped up a few times in the past on host duty, as well as having been chained up in the slush mines around here since 2016, and contributing the occasional story and narration as well. But I'm not as competent and capable as Summer, and can't possibly do everything they did, so I'm also excited to announce that Sophia Barker is stepping out of the darkness of said slush mines and onto the shining ramparts as the assistant editor, where she'll get such benefits as daylight and breakfast every day. Sophia is the loveliest possible person, and we're all thrilled to see her step into a larger role. Right, enough about us. You came here for a story, so let's get you a story. Your author this week is Avi Burton. Avi is a speculative fiction writer studying theatre and film at the University of Toronto. They are a mentee in the DV Mentor Programme with Diverse Voices Inc. and are currently revising a YA fantasy novel for publication. Their stories usually feature religion, curses, tragic chosen ones and, on occasion, laser swords. When not writing, they are usually fencing, hiking or talking to their cat. Your specially selected narrator for this story is Sarah Griffin. Born in Louisville, Kentucky, Sarah Griffin is a non-binary actor, comic, clown, voiceover artist and theatre maker, currently researching queer and disabled narratives in genre fiction. A multiple award-winning classical actor and Fulbright scholar, Sarah now makes most of their money doing silly voices and trying to make pratfalls land in a purely audio medium. It's a good life. Their hobbies include fire breathing, crochet and incongruity. Find out more on their website www.thesaragriffin.com That's thesaragriffin.com because there are many others like them in the world but they're the only one who is them. And now pay attention for our tale is about to begin and it's talking to you. Tadpole Prophecy by Avi Burton Read by Sarah Griffin It is cold, twilight on the cusp of true night, and they have sent you down to kill a monster. The uncut gems of frost crunch underneath your feet. The Dark Lord's castle is onyx and steel, and it is beautiful. It is a fortress that lurches out over the cliff face like a three-fingered hand jutting into the sky. It resonates and sings to you, drawing you forward. 
The windows are frosted glass and obscure what lurks behind. There are guards by the jagged portcullis, but they step aside as we pass. They know the duty we have been sent here to do. They cannot change the prophecy. You grip my handle tighter and wonder what the guards fear more. You or your destiny. I, linked to your thoughts by the bond we share, suggest that they are one and the same. If I wasn't me, you ask silently, do you think the guards would try and fight for their monster? Do you think that they would die for him? People always die for Dark Lords, willingly or not, I say. That is their purpose. We have ours. Purpose. Destiny. You shake your head and stride in to meet yours. When we first met, you were fourteen and drowning. Down past the grit of the marshes, there was a place where the water ran clean, and the river contorted itself into a waterfall. The village children liked to cluster by the edge in a misshapen constellation, then dare each other to leap to the bottom. Yet none of them ever had the courage to do so. Until you... You plunged into the rushing and twisting water, the bitter cold a shock to your skin. Gravity wrapped its arms around you and pulled you close. It was not a loving embrace, but a hungry one, as the water pressed in all around you and you screamed and screamed and screamed. No one on the surface heard you. Your hair... Black and long smothered itself around you like grasping tendrils of seaweed. The world around you was dark, like it is now, and you reached out your desperate hand for salvation and found me. I had been lost there in the sand for many years. They will tell you I was placed there deliberately, the high mages of the honored council, they will say that it was a challenge, a test for the next chosen one. But I was there when it happened, and I know better. You grabbed at the shape in the water and pulled me free from the weeds and mud. There was no divine light, like the bards claim. Nor did the far-off Dark Lord suddenly fear for his iron throne. We did not even form our bond that day. All that happened was that your hand met my hilt, and we both stopped drowning. The shield is heavy in your hands as you climb the spired stairs. You have been training for close to a year, but you have still never quite gotten used to the weight of it. The air here smells like pond water, heavy and stagnant. He is a monster. You are sure of it. The Dark Lord killed many innocents, you were told. His people fear him and hate him, and the good king and his mages have sent you to save them. You have not asked the people if they want to be delivered, but they know your purpose here and haven't stopped you yet. Tacit permission. It lets people get away with killing kings. Doubt needles away at you as you ascend the stairs of the Dark Lord's Keep. Crumbling stone chips away with each slow step. Destiny calls to you, the pull of a siren to the saw-toothed rock. I am here, a reassuring weight in your left hand. The blade of me gleams bronze in the low moonlight. The Dark Lord is waiting for you at the top of the stairs. He is wearing black scaled armor, a sharp contrast to your white and gold. He smiles at you. You see a little bit of pity in it. 
age makes its home in crow's feet around the corners of his eyes. The Dark Lord has his duty, and so do you. Both of you know how this will end. I am ready, hero, he rasps, raising the rusty edge of his halberd. You are not ready. This is good, you think. This is righteous. You have come all this way, and yet you are still unsure. You swing. When you first saw the good king's castle, it glittered like a river in the sunlight. A meagre metaphor, to be sure, but you had never left your village before, and it was all you had to compare. The walls of tourmaline and marble gleamed so bright and divine against the sun that you had to look away. I quivered before it, and I reached to reassure you, without a body capable of doing so. You approached on foot, dirt-stained and weary. You did not look like the Chosen One, not yet. No one bowed or stepped aside to let you do your duty. In fact, they often impeded it. You were not surprised. You were not born of gilded halls and easy fortunes. Your childhood was hard and hungry. It began in a backwater village of beige and bracken, a town with a population smaller than its name. You remembered the good king's soldiers taking taxes. You remembered your mother, a laundress, her hands cracked and bleeding from her work in the winter time. You remembered being knee-deep in marsh water, trapping tadpoles with your two small hands. It took patience to catch a tadpole. You cupped your hands underneath the water and waited until one swam into your palm and scooped it up into the sky like a sacrifice to an impassive blue god. The tadpole would thrash and squirm, its black animal eyes pleading up at you for mercy. You always let it go, in the end. Now, at the good king's castle, when the doors of the throne room shuddered open, you wondered if the tadpole felt chosen, like you were if some distant mage's prophecy decreed that it must be ripped from its home and presented before a cold and glittering god. You were being presented now, and you did not squirm or plead for mercy with black animal eyes. You saw the king with the honored council behind him and stood with a straight back. You did not like the way his eyes roved over you, even though he was a king and you were a peasant and therefore supposed to like everything he did. The queen sat next to him. You barely registered her. She was sunken into her throne, a fading shadow. Her nails made a quiet sound like ice cracking as she tapped them against her armored thigh. You are the one the prophecy spoke of, the king said voice rolling like slow thunder out over the room. I am, you responded, and I was proud of how your voice did not crack. He gestured, the impatient motion of a man accustomed to worship. Show me the sword. You knelt and presented me. I felt his hands against the flat of my blade. They were cold. I much preferred your grip. Could it be a forgery? The king asked the mages clustered behind him. You were not supposed to speak, but you laughed and showed him your empty pockets. Your majesty, does it look like I have the coins to pay for a fraud? The atmosphere of the room leveled out all of a sudden. Everyone turned to stare at you with storm clouds in their furrowed brows. The silence pressed in around you, heavy as the water you nearly drowned in. Only one person laughed with you, a girl in a red cap with bells hanging like beads of rain off the tip. She smiled at you and bounded out of the crowd, 
curtsying to the king and his council before turning it into a tumble. <laughs> Appearances can be deceiving, the jester said with her bright beaming laugh. <laughs> Princes, paupers, Princess King, only a court jester has use for fool's gold, but this one's genuine. Hear how she speaks. She couldn't lie if she tried. The air in the room seemed to soften, a sword no longer at your throat. The jester's eyes were dark and gleamed with something that was not quite amusement, not quite joy. It might have been madness. Her speech spoke well enough of that. The king rolled his eyes and waved her off. The mages gave their decree. The sword was real. You were the chosen one. And, suddenly, you were somebody. You still felt like a tadpole, though and wished to go back to the water. In the fortress, you fight the Dark Lord, as you have been taught to do. I am a gleaming beacon in your hands, bronze, steel, and sanctity. We move in sync, step, swing, dodge, swing. You know that later the bards will say how daring your strikes, how valiant your sword, how divine the fulfillment of this prophecy. But right now you feel only sweat and raging desperation. Step, swing, dodge, swing. Then the blunt side of the halberd ricochets into the side of your head, sending you stumbling to your knees. You will win. You have to win. Destiny says you will win. The press of the rusted blade against your throat says otherwise. You gasp as it bites in and draws blood, gentle as a kiss and damning as a gavel strike. Please. A cracked whisper escapes your mouth. This can't happen. Fate can't be fought. And there is a prophecy that says you will win. But then again, you never really believed in that, did you? You spent almost a year at the castle, training. The mages hovered around you like black flies. You were the child of farmers and the humble earth. You had never wielded a weapon in your life. The king measured your minimal progress with a disappointed stare, and the queen sank further into her throne. Only the jester smiled at you, and whispered soft secrets she'd overheard when no one else was listening. You told her about catching tadpoles in your village, and she told you about growing up in the gleaming, glorious, heart-bright capital of the kingdom. She recalled the golden days where even impoverished entertainers had a table of sweetmeat and ale. Now, she whispered, the tables were barren, and only the king ate well. You told her about your mother's cracked and calloused hands, and she told you that the queen never took her armor off for fear of assassination, and how the workwomen in the palace dared not enter the king's room alone. You told her, I thought kings were supposed to be glorious and great. That's why they are kings in the first place. She told you, We all believe what we need to. You told her that you were afraid. She told you she was too, and kissed your cheek. Please, you say. And the Dark Lord hesitates. The stone floor of the fortress is unforgiving. Dried blood crumbles on your lips. You reach up and remove your helm. Black hair tumbles out around your face. Your face, that still has the slight roundness of childhood to it. Your hands are shaking so hard your entire body quivers with them. You can barely breathe. Please, don't. He is evil. He will not listen to reason. 
He is a monster. Everyone told you so. But something shifts in the Dark Lord's eyes, and he lowers his weapon. You're just a child, he says, voice stone against stone. You nod, tears burning bitter rain against the lids of your eyes. How long have you been preparing for this fight? He asks. Almost a year. Almost a year? He echoes your words derisively. Three decades of work and effort and order, and they send a child with less than a year of training to try to stop me. He pauses and looks at you. He could be your father in a different life. Do you have a mother? You nod. Do you love her? You nod again. He turns away from you and glares out the frosted glass windows in the direction of the kingdom you came from. Then go, he says, his tired gaze fixed on the horizon. Run back to your mother, kid, and tell the king to send a real threat to fight me next time. You scrape wearily to your feet. It's a relief, almost, to be freed of the prophecy that haunts you. But guilt burns your stomach so hard you feel sick. You failed. No one ever told you that you could fail. You can't look in the Dark Lord's eyes. Your hand is white-knuckled on my hilt. Help! You plead with me silently. But I have no answer for you. In the end, I am only a weapon the same as you are. I can't have failed. I can't. You think you might throw up. You wish you could return the Dark Lord's mercy. You don't want it. He is still facing away from you. His halberd rests harmlessly next to him. You know your duty. I'm sorry. You think through your tears. And swing. The bards will exclude this part from their songs of you. One night, when the jester had gone and everyone else in the good king's castle was asleep, you curled your arms around me and cried. There were bruises on your back from training, and your heart hurt from missing home. Why am I here? Why was I chosen? You wept to me. I'm just a peasant girl. I can't do anything right. Tell me why you chose me, and why this must be my destiny. I asked if you really wanted to know the answer. I warned you it would hurt. You insisted. You weren't chosen. I told you with all the gentleness I could muster. I do not think it was enough. Forgive me, I am a creature of steel and sharpness. Gentleness does not come easily to me. And I said, no one was chosen. The prophecy could have been about anyone. Any child could have reached out their hand and pulled me from the weeds in that place where the river meets the rock. You were just the first to do so. You looked at me with tadpole eyes. I don't understand. If anyone could have done it, then why was I the only one? Someone has to bear the burden. But why would the Sword of Prophecy be at the bottom of a waterfall in the middle of nowhere in the first place? You insisted. The mages say it was a test, so that the next chosen one would have to pass a challenge of courage to reach me. <laughs> you snorted. The mages don't know what they're talking about. Correct. So what's the real reason? I said, The Dark Lord was the chosen one before you. He threw me there. 
you asked, why? Why would he reject his destiny? I said, so no one else would have to suffer as he had. Why are you telling me this? You ask, as you clean the Dark Lord's blood from where the blade of me meets the hilt. I was there. I know the answers already. Tell me the answer to this, then. What is your duty, Chosen One? You hesitate. To destroy the evil that plagues this land. Did you do it? You look down at the body of the Dark Lord, graying against the stone floor of the keep. I don't think so. Then what must you do to fulfill it? You look out across the black and barren land, to the castle that gleams in the rising dawn, tourmaline and marble. The castle where you trained to meet your destiny, you grab my hilt and rise to your feet. I need to kill a monster. And welcome back. I'm going to let the author share their thoughts with you before I share mine. Avi had this to say. It's a semi-deconstruction of the Chosen One trope, which is one of my favourite tropes. I deliberately avoided naming anything in order to emphasise the structure and archetypes the characters were trapped in. Also, if you picked up on a vague gay subtext between the Jester and the Chosen One, you're correct. So what really grabbed me here was not just that deconstruction of the familiar Chosen One trope, so beloved of 80s and 90s paperback fantasy, David Edding's Belgariad was my gateway drug for my sins, but of so many of the trappings of fantasy that sometimes get taken for granted. It is ridiculous that any Chosen One is prepared so quickly, that some random farm kid can have any hope of standing up to tyrants when royalty spent their whole lives training for war. And worst of all, it's ridiculous that evil is ever so clear cut. We've seen a lot of comic book villainy in our politics these last few years, sure, Hello to you from the United Kingdom, we elected an actual buffoon who thinks laws don't apply to him. But by and large, real evil is less dark deeds and more banality, bureaucracy and self-interest. Such people are often lying to themselves as much as to you when they claim to be good people doing important work and identifying them is sometimes a lifetime's work. It's not always easy to spot the people who are truly doing you harm. But the one lesson I've slowly... Finally, come to learn. Trust your gut, not your ears. Don't think about what they're telling you. Think about how they make you feel. And then act on that. And may fate grant you the weapons you need. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at Podcastle, your co-editors Shingai and Jerry Kagunda and Eleanor Arwood, your assistant editor Sophia Barker and audio engineer Peter Adrian Berifesh, Forum moderator Ossie Cat, and our many wonderful first readers, Tierney Bailey, Aidan Doyle, Amelia Harrington, Kai Hudson, Craig Jackson, Devon Martin, Julia Pat, Hamilton Perez, Shrik Kripper Krishna Prasad, Zeev Wheaties, and Caitlin Zvanovich, and myself, Matt Dovey. Thank you for letting us share another story with you. The legal bit. Podcastle is part of Escape Artists Incorporated. And this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can share it, and please do, but you cannot sell it and you cannot change it. If you want specifics, check creativecommons.org. Our music is by Shiva in Exile. Everything we do on Podcastle is 100% donor funded. And if you'd like to support what we and the rest of Escape Artists do, please join us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash eapodcasts. Prefer another method? There's details for supporting us via Twitch, Amazon Prime, Ko-fi and PayPal on escapeartist.net. We'll be back next Tuesday with another fantastic tale. In the meantime, you might care to check out our sister podcasts, Escape Pod for Science Fiction 
Pseudopod for horror, or Cast of Wonders for YA speculative fiction. If your heart belongs to us, though, we'll see you next week. Be safe and be kind. <laughs>